Hello, and welcome to Conversations with Marsha by The Great Connections, which is an educational institution specializing in innovative and transformational experiences for young adults. We help them build lives of adventure and achievement. Please visit our website at thegreatconnections.org. I'm Marsha Familaro Enright, Program Director, and this is In Conversations with Marsha, we discuss a variety of issues related to optimal education, education with a wide variety of guests. Please hit the bell and subscribe. This morning, I'd like to say hello to Mike Cragen. How are you doing this morning, Mike? I'm great, Marsha. Good to be here. Good, good. Mike is a former management consultant who specialized in computer systems, hailing from Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Fortunately, he missed the worst of Hurricane Ida yesterday, and he's able to join us today. Uh, his uh, internet and his electricity is working. That's that's amazing considering what happened, right? Yeah, there were quite a few people that uh, aren't, weren't so lucky around here. Yeah, like a million or something, right? In the whole mm -hmm. state. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, Mike got interested in this system of self-discovery in 1986 called Dependable Strengths. And it was such a powerful experience for him that he is... Uh, been very interested in spreading the word about it ever since then and helping other people use it. Um, he, he, I, I have a number of questions for him about it, and this is what we're going to talk about today. Uh, so you're good with that, Mike? Yes, I am. All right. So what is Dependable Strengths, and how did you come across it? Yeah, when uh, in 1986, I had been working as a management consultant. Uh, and I found myself looking for a job. And so the question was, what was I going to do with the rest of my life? And it wasn't clear at all. So I went to the local library. I got this book by Bernard Haldane, Career Satisfaction and Success. And it consisted of his theory of how we find our strengths. And I spent three days working through the exercises in my office at home. And I discovered a lot of things that turned out to really help me. Uh, would you like to know the, his theory in a nutshell? Yeah, that'd be yeah, great. Yeah. He, he believed that our strengths showed up in what he called good experiences. And a good experience has three criteria. You enjoy doing it, you felt you did it well, and you were proud of it. And it could come from any time of your life. It could be something very big or it could be something rather small. And, uh, and so that's basically what, is, what goes on in the workshops that are offered by, by people like myself who are facilitators for dependable strengths. Can you want to give us an, like an example? Yes, I'll give you one that I know the best for myself is I had worked for six years as a management consultant working on all varieties of computerized uh, information systems, consulting engagements. And when I started to look at what my good experiences were from that time, uh, one popped out that surprised me. And that was, a, I had done a course for incoming consultants on presentation skills. <clears throat> and I enjoyed that more than any of the other assignments. Mm -hmm. um, I, I got good feedback from it. I, I was really pleased with the way I had done it. And yet I had never really as, even given so much as a Toastmaster speech at the time. So um, that, that was important to me. I also realized that when I looked at my bookshelf, there weren't a lot of accounting and computer books up there. I had a lot of books on philosophy and psychology and communications and personal development. C clearly I had some interest outside of, of uh, computers and accounting. So <clears throat> that was an important revelation to me. I, I should have known it, but I didn't. And so I was able to use that information as I uh, changed directions in my career and started doing other things. And I've used it ever since. I've used it uh, consistently year after year ever since, the dependable strengths process. So, uh, just reiterate your questions. Gosh, we're getting a lot of uh, Just reiterate the three questions and how it related to what you discovered. Okay. Uh, the three questions are you, you identify what he calls a, a good experience. He used to call it an accomplishment, but he, but he found that some cultures um, were 
shied away from claiming accomplishments. They had been told that it was immodest to, to uh, claim an accomplishment. So he, he okay. changed it to good experiences. But basically, uh, you look back and you say, did I enjoy doing this? Um, do I feel I did it well? It's something you did. And were you proud of it? And so, uh, again, in, in, the, in the case of the, it was a short assignment that I had to do a presentation skills course to a group of incoming consultants. And I remember I got the, the evaluation sheets back and they were all very uh, positive and you know, thanking me for doing it. Um, the partner for the firm I uh, worked for sent me a nice letter and I would sit there going through, you know, you would have thought I was uh, the next coming of Winston Churchill. Uh, <laughs> it turned out not to be true. You, you have to distinguish between how good you actually did it and whether it indicated an actual strength or whether it's a potential. And I think in my case back there it was a potential. I needed to develop that strength. Mm -hmm. But it happens a lot with people. They, they come across what these good experiences and in, in doing so, they can, they can change the direction of their job or their studies or, or change their interests. And, and um, how did this process lead you to looking at the books on your self, shelf? You just became more self-reflective? That was one of the questions in the, in the book. He, he said, you know, what subjects do you did you enjoy after you finished school? Mm -hmm. uh, that, that tends to be a real clue as to what, what you might want to spend more time on. I meet people all the time that their, their uh, primary job is something they do for the money and they have hobbies or avocations outside of their job that really mean more to them in, in a lot of cases. Mm -hmm. Well, I think some people, because of the necessities of their life, uh, do a job that's not particularly of their interest, but it makes them money. And so then they develop their interests in the outside avocations. I think you're absolutely right. You know, we, we pick up things. In, in my case, I had, uh, I had gone into the seminary for a year after I got out of high school. And when I came back again, I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. My father uh, was a CPA. He said, why don't you go into accounting? You'll be able to make a living that way. I knew I wanted to do something in business to make a living. And so that's what I did, but I didn't really have a, a, a powerful firsthand interest in accounting. Mm -hmm. um, and so, that, that's the kind of what you're saying is exactly right. So many people get into something because it was recommended by a teacher or a friend or, or it just happened to be there and they didn't know. So they had to find out. Uh, dependable strengths can help analyze, you know, can help you analyze your job and whether it has uh, 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 the challenges and the, and the things that really interest you. You know, it's interesting. <laughs> this is a problem of our, our culture where we're so wealthy, we can choose what we want to do. Mm -hmm. uh, I could, because I was actually thinking about people years ago whom um, they, they just had to take any job. It wasn't you know in the Great Depression or World War II or afterwards, they just had to take a job and it wasn't necessarily something that they wanted to do especially, but it was of a necessity in order to make money. So it's interesting that we've gotten to the point in our culture where it's so uh, we're so wealthy, we have these problems of almost too much choice and people don't know how to navigate that. So this is where this kind of system is really useful. Yeah, I think it is. As I said, it's something that once you go through it, you can continue to use it. You can continue to ask those three questions about the past year or the past three years or the past five years and see whether you're still on track or, or whether you're getting away from things that, uh, you know, really are of value to you and, and you do well. I, I think the key to dependable strength is you love using it and, uh, and you do it well. So it, it's a combination of competence and uh, valuing that speech. We can also have strengths that aren't dependable strengths. You can do them and you can do them well, but you don't particularly enjoy doing those things. Mm -hmm. um, th there was an interesting case that we present in the workshops, there was a woman that uh, had uh, strengths 
she was she had a good memory. She was good with words, writing. She liked to compete. She liked to perform. Those were some of her strengths. And so she got a job as a trial lawyer. And she was assigned to do research for one of the senior partners. And she did such a good job. They kept her in the research department. Mm -hmm. And she didn't like that. Her, her strengths of being able to perform and use her words weren't being put to use in the research department. And, you know, that's where people burn out. They, they'll get into a job where they're not using the strengths that they really value and want to use. And, and so they, they get stuck there because they're, she was good at it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so uh, this is one thing that dependable strengths can help people with. I've had people go through my workshops and they'll, they'll realize that there was some aspect of the job that they liked when they started. And now it's no longer stimulating them. Mm -hmm. So they, can, they, can, they have the option of going to their boss and talking about, you know, do we want to make some changes? Or, the, or they could also go pursue other options. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's very important. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with this or how many of the viewers are, but you know, there's this theory of flow that mm -hmm. was that's been developed in the last 30 years uh, by a psychologist, and which in which he identifies what are the conditions in which you have an optimal experience, mm -hmm. and it's one in which it's uh, challenging enough to be to keep your interest, but not so challenging as to be overwhelming. So it's kind of a balance of that. And it, and you get this kind of arc in, in uh, different jobs where at first it's challenging, sometimes way too challenging and you have a lot of anxiety and then you reach a certain mastery of it. And then, then it's interesting because you're become competent at it and you're able to implement the, the skills that you've used very well, but then you, you're so good at it that it becomes boring. And that's when you have to go on and find something else to do. And yeah, I've heard I've heard others uh, say something similar that you know when your job gets too easy or too hard, that's that's a that's a point where you want to reconsider. And, and I, I think you're right. When you're doing things you really love to do, it's like you're not even working. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You, you can you and the other thing is I found that I started to find people who had similar interest in communications and uh, the subjects that I was interested in. And you can look for groups that will help you develop yourself as well as use your, your strengths. And so they're, they're a big, <clears throat> they're a support network for you. Yes, yes. Yeah. You know, there's another aspect to this though that I think people don't always realize, which is you can become interested in in something out of doing it and mm -hmm. it's something that people don't always realize i know in me uh, chicken mihai's book on flow he talks about this factory worker <clears throat> who uh, basically would move from job to job in the factory as he would master each job and he would keep himself interested in that so eventually he had done 28 different jobs in the factory uh, but he wouldn't. He never wanted to become management. So there, he he was self-aware of what you're talking about. Like, what are his real strengths and interests? He didn't want to do management. He wanted to do the actual factory processes. And then he also had this avocation at home, where he he did fabulous gardens, and he and he, and, and he did more and more complex arrangements in the gardens as he challenged himself. So that's an interesting thing to try to remember. And it sounds like dependable strengths helps you recognize what things you find interesting and probably challenging to do. Yes, and I think uh, both are important. No, knowing what you like to do and what you do well is important. And also knowing what you don't like to do. So, you know, I've had a, I've had a chance, the opportunity to work a lot of different jobs. I think I've had a dozen jobs, including working for myself twice. Mm -hmm. But um, some of those jobs I liked, some of them I didn't like. Mm -hmm. And so it helps you know what to stay away from, which is important. I know when I started doing uh, dependable strengths workshops after I retired, what I really wanted to do was facilitate the workshop. The enjoyment for me was mm -hmm. hearing people's stories, seeing the uh, amazing strengths of the people that come to the workshops, what I didn't want to do 
was uh, deal with all the administration and logistics that you have to do if you're going to put on something like that. So I partnered with uh, the career center down at the local library. They had a system set up to do the administration, to to Mm -hmm. take in people that were enrolled to put out information about it. They had the audio video equipment. So they took the logistics and the administration off. So when you know your strengths and you know other people's strengths, you can find people that have complementary strengths to work mm-hmm. with. Uh, and this turns out to be very important for leaders as well. When you're, when you're deciding how to staff a project, mm-hmm. you wanna get your team members in the place where they can use their best strengths. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and I think that's, a, that's another place where, uh, you know, being cognizant of strengths can really have great value. Oh yeah, that's oh, yeah. really important. I think I think really good leaders have always known that, even if they've never heard of dependable strengths. So yeah. it's it's not something that was uh, you know uh, unique uh, to dependable strengths. Right. So tell us about what criteria did Haldane use to identify these strengths? How did he go about coming up with this system? <clears throat> it was it was really interesting. Um, there's a there's a a, a book by uh, Dr. Kate. Dutro, uh, she put put together 14 articles about uh, Bernard Haldane, and one of the ones was how he um, how he originated it. He he got interested at the age of 15 in why some people love their work and some people didn't. Uh, that that was a, a kind of amazing, and uh, he he was uh, he was from Britain. He came to the U.S. Uh, with a year of uh, medical school under his belt. And he found out that none of his credits were going to be acceptable in the U.S. So rather than starting over, he decided to do something else. And uh, he he took uh, odd jobs like fuller brush salesman and magazine salesman, as uh, some of us have done. And none of those appealed to him. And he got a job as a a editor, uh, associate editor for a a periodical. And when World War II veterans started coming home, uh, an organization he belonged to asked him to see what he could do to help them find work. Mm-hmm. And his, his interest in, you know, what people did well and, you know, why some were happy, that's when it all came into play. He would interview the returning veterans. He would figure out what they liked doing best, what they did well. He would create basically a letter of introduction and he would go over it until he was sure that they could really do what they said he would, what they said they could do. Mm-hmm. That was important. Mm-hmm. And, the, and the outcome of it was, I think hundreds of them got jobs, you know, word spread that here was a guy that could help you get a job. Ah. And Harvard found out about him and uh, they, they used his process with their alumni program at one time. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, so that uh, made him more well known. And with that, he launched his own business, uh, which he uh, which he ran successfully uh, for some time, but uh, sold in uh, 1974. Um, so so that was that was how he got started in it. And then I think it was 1987. He worked on a project uh, at the University of uh, Washington with uh, Dr. Gerald Forster to uh, to to come up with the uh, Dependable Strengths uh, project uh, in which they analyze dependable strengths. Uh, the, the full name of it is the Dependable Strengths Articulation Process. But after we get in, we most of us shorten it to Dependable Strengths or DS when we're, when we're talking informally. Sure. Um, th- they, were, they were looking at how it affected people uh, and, what, and you know, how they might improve on it. Mm-hmm. So I know I previously asked you how it was validated, and you said it's it was more a matter of how often it was used. Can you tell us a little bit about how the program spread and how many people have used it and any kind of success measures? You know, that was an interesting question on how it was validated. Like I said, the, uh, the Dependable Strength Project found that, um, you know, it helped increase people's self-esteem and it changed the locus of control to internal, which means that they start making decisions more based on their own criteria 
than than outside than outside criteria. In other words, an employee is not sitting around waiting for his employer to train him. He starts uh, making his own choices and maybe investing his own money in training. Uh, that, that's what happened to me. I don't have the statistic. It's possible that uh, the Center for Dependable Strengths has some of them. As far as validating it, uh, my, my own feeling is it doesn't take very long to go through the process. Uh, a person can take the online uh, program that's available in several hours over a couple of days. And if it works for you, if it helps you see strengths and develop those strengths, then uh, what else would you need to know? Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's the way it's been for me. I've used it myself. I've seen other people use it in the workshops. I've seen people who didn't have a job. They've been unemployed for months, go through the workshop, and suddenly they're fired up. They, they realize from looking at actual experience that they have, mm -hmm. that they have capabilities that they had forgotten about. Mm -hmm. Or they weren't they weren't focused on because they they've been sending out resumes and getting nothing back mm -hmm. for, for months and suddenly they think I can do things. The other thing is they may see strengths that they haven't used or areas mm -hmm. of interest that that were once there but don't interest but they haven't uh, actually worked in any of those. Mm -hmm. So now they've got options. They don't have to take any of them. But now they can decide, OK, I'm going to study this area rather than this one. And they can combine those strengths uh, in a particular job or shift them around to use them differently. So I don't I don't I don't see any. There's no question in my mind that it's a process that has value. Mm -hmm. the, it, we're all all of us are told what we can't do, what we didn't do right, where we failed, what went wrong. but too often we don't know what we, we don't see what we did right, what we did well. And that's what dependable strengths, that's where dependable strengths shines in, in, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. It helps people understand that they really have capabilities and that they've used them in the past. And that kind of firsthand experience is very energizing. It, it, it gives you the feeling of, yes, I can do something, even if the situation that I'm facing right now is very difficult. Uh, that, that can be the difference between being motivated to do something uh, or, or just spiraling downward. Oh, I can oh. imagine what a big difference it makes for any uh, person who's been getting rejection letters or, or no job for months. And then and you just start thinking, well, what's wrong with me? You know, why, why doesn't anybody want me? And, and that's got to be a huge turnaround to recognize that you are capable and you can do things and maybe you need to take a new direction. Yeah, I had a young woman in, in one of my workshops, and um, she had done some incredible things. She had, she had developed a program to encourage young kids to read. And what she did is she got, she enlisted the support of some barber shops, and she had them read at the oh, barber shop. Clever. And when she was when she was telling the group about this. She's going through all the things she did. I mean, she did a great job of marketing, selling, coming up with the idea. And, and she had several of those things as we talked about her strengths. And, and at the end, you know, everybody was commenting on, on you know, uh, her, her strengths, her, her talents. And when she sat down, she said, wow. She says, yesterday I was really depressed. Today oh, wow. I feel on top of the world. That, that happens. Yeah. And, and of course, you've got to build on that. You can't, you know, just can't ride that feeling alone. That's, that's fantastic. I love stories like that. Yeah. I love stories like that. And it's got to be extremely helpful for young people who don't know uh, what they should be doing with themselves, you know. And of, and of course, that, that applies to most of us <laughs> who uh, at 18 or 20 don't know exactly what we're going to do. I, I'm reminded of Steve Jobs dropping out of college because, you know, here, here's a guy who's a genius. He didn't know what he wanted to do yeah. uh, at the time. He had to stumble around from one thing to another. Eventually, he figured it out nicely. So, yeah, um, well, you but know, it certainly I, happens. I, what, what I've noticed is that most people, as they're growing up, have a very narrow um, knowledge about what kind of jobs are available. Usually it's whatever the parents are doing or the parents' friends or something like that. And they don't know 
all of the amazing possibilities in the world, some of which aren't even created yet, right? Like Steve Jobs effectively created his own job in a way. Uh, and, you know, and so, I mean, I've, I, I love to ask the question, what were computer programmers doing during the Middle Ages? <laughs> you know, what, what were their skills being used for? But anyway, so um, it's, it's very useful to be able to, to realize this kind of thing. So how are you using the system now? Tell us a little bit about that. Well, I'll give you the, the best example was when I, when I got ready to retire from uh, 50 years in, of doing uh, computer and financial and consulting work about five years ago, I was back to the same question. What am I going to do for the rest of my life? Mm -hmm. And of course, during my career, once I realized I like speaking and I like training, I was, I was able to make that part of my uh, job uh, with the state auditor's office. I did a lot of speaking and a lot of training and I like that. So I wanted to keep that in my life. So that's when I decided <clears throat> I, would, I would go become a facilitator for dependable strengths. The people at the center up there said, come on up, uh, we'll, we'll run you through our uh, facilitation pro program. Mm -hmm. And so I did that. And, uh, and then the question was, I had to rebuild my network. I, I knew uh, hundreds of people that I had worked with for the last few years, and that was going to all disappear when I retired. <laughs> so uh, I joined a local Toastmaster club. I did some talks on dependable strengths. I decided to create a workshop for that. And I invited them to come. So I had people from the Toastmaster club come to the workshop mm -hmm. and they helped support that. And I also uh, continued that with other Toastmaster groups. I did some dependable strengths workshops for them. Mm -hmm. And I began to expand. I got into online uh, Toastmaster club. And so it's, it's, it's a way of taking the strengths that I have and my interests, which were communications, which I think is helpful to any job, whether it's a plumber or a philosopher, the better you can express yourself, the better you'll be. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and also things like goal setting, again, no matter what the job, being able to set goals and reach those goals are, are crucially important to, to progress, particularly financial progress. So I've continued to do that. And I've, I've met people all over the country. I just finished uh, doing a, a, a Zoom-based version of this Dependable Strength Workshop for the first time a couple of weeks ago. And I had people from California to Florida in this small group. So uh, that, was, that was very interesting because I had, I had thought I was going to work on this just locally when I had to do everything physically. Now with Zoom, it's a game changer. Uh, yeah. It can be done anywhere. And you don't have to fly fly to other parts of the country to do it. Don't have to fly there. The, the people can do it on their own schedule. So um, I'm hoping it will become available to more people that way. Cool. All right. Well, uh, we're going to put the information about the books, the uh, website, um, at the any, anything that, that's a good resource about Dependable Strengths. We'll put it in the notes, the program notes to this conversation. Uh, is there anything you'd like to add before we we um, finalize our conversation? Um, I, I would just um, say that the people at the Center for Dependable Strengths have always supported me whenever I've called them with a question. All of the information about Haldane and their workshops uh, are on their uh, website. Uh, so I do this as an avocation, not as a business. So the best place, if you want to find out more, uh, I would go to their website and take a look at that. And of course, if you have any questions and you want to uh, talk about it, uh, have something special you want to ask, uh, you can put my email address up there and they can, they're welcome to contact me if, uh, if I can help them in any way. Sounds great. Okay. Well, thank you so much for your time. This is really a great system to, to learn about. And I hope that we'll be able to use it um, in, well, I didn't mention this at the beginning of the program, but I'm working on starting a new college. and. Mm -hmm. I think this would be a great system to use to help the young people in the college. Yeah, yeah. most of the people that were in my uh, facilitator training class were affiliated with colleges and community colleges and education. So I think that would be uh, something that you'll, you'll find very interesting. Sounds good. And you know, as always, make your own uh, judgments about the value of it. All righty. Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. I appreciate yeah. the time. Okay.